topic, you know, of your, your appearance of knowing Hebrew when you don't know any Hebrew. I've got either. a whole stable of Hebrew scholars that well, volunteer so for read reasons to believe. Okay? Sure. And, I, and I, I can talk to people who read Hebrew also, but I don't want you to you know, mislead the audience into thinking you know Hebrew when you don't, and neither do I. All I can do, but I don't think God writes a book where we have to know Hebrew. The God that I worship is able to write a book and then preserve it and give it to us in a form that I can read and understand. And I'm telling you, nobody, if you, if, if you went to a mission field where there were no Christians and no concept of Christianity and just gave this book to them and said, what does it say? All of them would come back and say, it says six days, just like we have today. Kent, I've been on the mission field. That's not simply true. I mean, I've met all kinds of people who have drawn the conclusion these are long periods of time. Please name one. Okay. I mean, uh, there's some ladies that work with us in our office. Uh, raised in Arkansas, uh, read the Bible on their own, uh, mm -hmm. came to that conclusion, high school education. These are plain folk. Well, there you had the key right there. If they got a high school education in the public school, they would have been taught evolution, and then they would have read the Bible with I'm a preconceived idea. I'm talking 11 idea. years of age. I mean, this is before they hit the high school years. Well, and when I read your testimony also in your book about how you, you came to the Bible, you had already decided the Big Bang Theory is true. That was already a given in your mind. You'd already of course, decided the Bible you, teaches it. No, it doesn't. But you'd already <laughs> decided the, earth is billion, the universe is billions of years old, and now you come to the Bible and try to force that interpretation on God's Word. That's the wrong way to come to it. Well, well let, me, let me bring up this thing about uh, Exodus chapter 20 again. Yes. And that, uh, again, uh, Archer comments on this. He did this at the Council for Biblical Inerrancy when they were dry, uh, writing the draft, and they asked him to do the exegesis on this. Uh, Gleason Archer used to teach at Trinity Divinity School. Uh, Bruce Walke used to teach, was chairman of Old Testament at Dallas. These guys wrote a workbook on the Old Testament together, and this is uh, part of their commentary. In terms of Exodus 20, uh, 8 through 11, in terms of what the Sabbath is mentioning and referring back to, he says, by no means does this demonstrate that 24-hour intervals were involved in the first six days any more than the eight-day celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles proves that the wilderness wanderings under Moses occupied only days. Remember, Israel wandered in the uh, wilderness for 40 years. So it was a symbolic commemoration of that time is what they're saying. And I just point this out, that how do we, the, the very question you guys are grappling here, for our people that are at home, how are they supposed to approach this? You've got the verse in Genesis chapter 2 where it does seem to say that a day refers to the whole spectrum of whatever time period those six days, seven days occurred uh, in the first chapter. You have the day of the Lord, which everybody seems to agree can go on into eternity. You've got other suggestions of periods of time. If it opens the door, there have been people that I have known that have just approached it and said that's a possibility. They haven't known the science, but it's a possibility. But I'm saying, if it is a possibility, are evangelicals wrong in exploring that possibility? Because oh, you do have biblical support in other places for it. I think you should explore all possibilities. I'm an, I'm an educator. I think when you teach, a, a, a real true education shows the kids all the options. I think we should study that option that the days might be long periods of time. I would like you to show me any place in Scripture where it says a day is not a 24-hour day, if it also uses the, the evening and the morning phrase with it, and the first day, the second day, the third day. I mean, the Bible just couldn't be more clear. And then it's reinforced in Exodus chapter 20 and in Exodus chapter 31 about God did it all in six days. Well, let's and, pick that theme up. I mean, Exodus sure. 20. Uh, that whole idea of the fourth commandment is repeated five times in the Levitical law. Only two of the five times does it give you the divine analogy, uh, four and six days. And we also note in both cases the preposition is not in the original. It simply says four six right, days, not going four off in your six days. Imagine Hebrew again. Now let's That's stick with not imagine like, Hebrew. Okay, you, you don't speak Hebrew, and neither do I. Okay. Well, I've checked it out. I've checked it out with Hebrew scholars. They okay. assure me that the preposition is not there. I've okay. read have the you, actual text. It's not in the original. And have you read the long critique of what you just said on Answers in Genesis website about this very topic you're talking about. Sure have. And what's your response? My response is it doesn't withstand the scrutiny of Hebrew scholarship. He also ignores the problem of Leviticus uh, chapter 25. There you got the case of God setting up a work period and a rest period for the agricultural land. It is to be worked six years and rested on the seventh year. Correct. So I go along with Gleese and Archer. What you got in Exodus 20 is an analogy, not an exact equation. Well, there I disagree. 
All right, we're going to take a, a break, and uh, when we come back, we're going on to uh, the second day to find out. We're going down toward Adam and Eve, when they were created, when the animals were created, and what was going on. So stick with us. We'll be right back. We're talking with uh, Dr. Hugh Ross, who received his Ph.D. in astronomy from the University of Toronto and did postdoctoral research on Quasar at Caltech. And Dr. Kent Hoven, who received his Ph.D. in education, writing his doctoral dissertation on the subject of creation versus evolution. Our topic is, are the universe and the Earth billions of years old or just thousands of years old? Are Genesis 1 and 2 compatible with contemporary scientific evidence? Should they be? And uh, that's a good question, too, but we're going to go down using, using chapter one of Genesis because a lot of folks have uh, kind of discarded this. And I thought, let's have our scientists, uh, let's actually comment on what these verses are talking about. We hit day one last, last time. We're going to talk about day two, Genesis 1, 6 through 8, and says, And God said, Let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. Hugh, what happened on day two? Well, hopefully we agree, agree here. I mean, I see that as a reference to God establishing a stable, abundant water cycle. In fact, one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Robert Newman, is both an astronomer and a theologian, wrote his master's thesis in theology on that very point. Careful exegesis of the words reveals that it's speaking about God setting up an abundance of water in the atmosphere, the troposphere more correctly, water in the ocean, and you've got a cycling which is going to make possible sufficient water in the future continental land masses. All right. Kurt, okay. Well, if God set up the water cycle then, why did it say later it had not rained upon the earth? You know, what you're saying is, this, had it rained upon the earth for millions of years, was there a normal water cycle before? Is this all in, day, in day two? Definitely. Well, that the Bible says very clearly it had not rained no, upon doesn't. the earth. No, you're, you're quoting from Genesis chapter 2. It says, God, a mist went forth and watered the face of the ground because it had not rained upon the earth. Yeah, but it's in the same context that there is no man, no plant. I mean, it's simply uh, a restatement of the initial conditions you've got there in Genesis 1. I mean, what you have in Genesis 2 is a second account of creation with a focus on human beings. The second account of creation focusing on day 6. Yes. All of chapter 2, except for the first four verses, is dealing with what happened in the garden only, and only on day 6. It's not talking about... Um, but you're quoting verses 5 and 6 out of Genesis 2, mm -hmm. and it's simply establishing the context for God creating Adam and placing him in the Garden of Eden and later creating Eve. It how, doesn't how, how give much, you an ordered list. How much later did he create Eve? Was it the same day? Uh, the same sixth day, correct, which, which was a long period of time. Which was a long period of time. Right. Okay, this is where you got to make sure I understand what you really mean sure. by what you say, because I've read enough of your stuff to know how to check that out. The, uh, so you think Adam was there for a long time by himself. You say he had to recover from surgery and uh, had to go to college for a semester and learn. He had to name all the animals. Name all the animals, and that took a long time. He had to work the Garden of Eden, correct. Well, let's, so, let's go back to day three. We're going to get to that, all right? Uh, what happened with Adam and Eve, but let's keep it in context, because our folks out here are trying to follow. So the fact is, basically, uh, uh, day two, we had what happen? Water cycle. Water cycle. I disagree. Okay. I think on day two, we had a firmament established, which is clearly later spelled out in Genesis 1.20 as being the place where the birds fly. Genesis 1.20 says the birds fly in the firmament of heaven. So that's the atmosphere. It says there was water above this atmosphere. That's what it says very clearly. And then also in Psalm 148, verse 4, it says there are, there are still waters above the heavens. I suspect God made three heavens. First heaven is the atmosphere where the birds fly. The second heaven is where the stars are. We call it outer space, sun, moon, and stars. The third heaven is where God lives. Second Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul tells about being caught up to the third heaven. And apparently there was a water barrier between each of those. Uh, the first one is probably now gone. That's what fell down at the flood. I don't know if it was ice or water or moisture or what. But wouldn't it the... fall down immediately? What's well, going to hold it up there? If, if I read your book and it, it, you, you, you make a straw, what's called a straw man argument, you assume that all the water for the flood came from this canopy. Even if some of it just came from the no, canopy, still got a problem. No, there's water in the sky right now. Yeah, but I there's mean... There's plenty of it. Okay. Clouds are water, they float just fine. I don't know so what you don't believe there's any more water up there before the flood than after the flood? 
I think there was somehow a canopy of water suspended up there. I can't prove this. This is the canopy Any theory. Any different than what we have right now? Oh, probably so. I think that... Then it's it, got to come down. It did come down. It rained.